Epistemological questions essentially answers, how do you know something? What is the nature of the relationship between the knower and what is known, or what you want to know, between the researcher and what is being researched? And methodological questions essentially answers the question about how you go about finding out this knowledge. What is it that you do to get to the knowledge that you are looking for? So essentially, there are three main paradigms that I would like to, to put forward today. There are a few more, but I will um, use these three to um, illustrate the different types of, of paradigms. On the far left, you have positivism, which essentially is a very structured paradigm. They believe that knowledge exists and that you need to look for the knowledge within specific boundaries. And that is usually a very quantitative approach that is then followed. On the far right, you have constructivism. It is also known as interpretivism. And they usually believe that you can create knowledge. You can speak to people who are knowledgeable about a specific phenomenon that you are busy investigating and these people can give you information that can allow you to elaborate and, and grow um, the knowledge within that specific realm. And so that is more qualitatively based. And in the middle, you've got pragmatism, which essentially says that there are certain components of this knowledge that you cannot change, that is very structured. But there's another component of this knowledge that you can go and create, that you can change and alter according to how phenomena change over a period of time. And so pragmatism is a combination between positivism and constructivism that essentially uses a mixed method approach, meaning that you have quantitative and qualitative methods and techniques that are being used to identify and discover the information and the knowledge that you are looking for. So essentially, if you look at how research are conducted, you are led by your paradigm. Are you positivist? Are you pragmatist? Or are you constructivist? There are other um, permutations in between. Are you a little bit more constructivist than, posit than positivist? Then you to the right of pragmatism. Or are you a little bit more structured? and a smaller percentage is what you believe can be changed than you to the left of pragmatism, but to the right of positivism, right? So there are other permutations, but we will not look at those today. So you have a paradigm and essentially you would then have a research design. After your research design, you would look at your methodology as a quantitative or qualitative research. And you would then identify methods and techniques of how you're going to collect this information and how you're going to analyze the information that you have collected. So if we look at the differences between qualitative and quantitative approaches. On the ontological side, there's multiple um, subjectively derived realities that coexist. In other words, you can go and collect the data from different sources and, and different methods can be employed to do this. Um, on, the, on the quantitative side, there's a single objective world. Essentially, when, with qualitative research, the researcher is responsible for collecting the data. And therefore, the researcher is the one that will interact with the phenomenon. This researcher will interact with the people that will share the information and the knowledge that is being looked for. Um, and the researcher will also therefore um, act in a value-laden or biased fashion. And, and it's therefore important to um, try and, and, and follow a scientific approach so that the bias is, is retained um, as much as possible and that the people that you're trying to extract information from is not unduly influenced to respond in a way that you want them to respond in. Um, from a rhetorical point of view, um, because the researcher is the one that is collecting the information, um, the 
um, methods used are very personalized. It's, it's, it's context-based language that are being used. So if you are in a very professional environment, you will use professional language. If you're in a technical environment, you will use technical language. So essentially the language differs according to the persons that you are interacting with. Where on the quanti qualitative, sorry, on the quantitative side, it is um, very impersonal and largely just seeking to address a specific phenomena. It's not customized to the context or the environment. Um, on the methodological side, qualitative research essentially um, is, where, is, is inductive, where you can create knowledge. And on the other hand, it's deductive if you're doing a quantitative research because you are simply just interpreting the knowledge that is already there. You can change the screen. So just in a nutshell, quantitative is very structured and you're allowed only to operate within the boundaries of that specific phenomena. Where with quantitative research, essentially it's, it's, it's unstructured and you essentially go about finding knowledge as you come across certain data. If we look at research designs, there are five different research designs that I've highlighted here as um, uh, being part of a qualitative research. Phenomenology essentially exam examines the uniqueness of individuals' lived experiences. Um, each person has their own reality. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in another language, we could say that people have different cultures. And so the culture um, has its own knowledge base that, that goes with it. So that's probably the best way that I can explain to you. Each person has a different reality, a different way in how they see the world, in how they create knowledge and interact with it. Ground theory essentially is a theory that is uh, used where um, there is not a lot of information available about the specific phenomena that you are investigating and you would then develop uh, knowledge as you go along um, in the absence of um, prior knowledge um, being there. Ethnography looks at um, cultural characteristics and you would essentially go into an environment and live within that environment for a specific period of time, during which time you will observe directly um, how things are done and, and how uh, in which process things unfold and so forth and so forth. The historical data essentially describes and examines events that has happened previously with the objective of anticipating what could happen going forward. And then you have case studies that looks at in-depth experiences of a person or family or group or community or an institution, an organization or so on. Please share, um, change the screen. Okay, so what is qualitative research? Um, qualitative researchers look at things in their natural settings they want to make sense of or interpret the meaning that people bring to them. Okay, you can change this slide. So there are certain assumptions of qualitative research. And previously we looked at all these um, scientific words, ontological, epistemological, axiological, rhetorical, methodological. And this is really just going to try and break it down a little bit more into, into everyday language so that um, you, you understand it better. So essentially qualitative research seeks to explore phenomena, a fact, an occurrence or a circumstance. It is descriptive in nature, it looks at what happened. It is concerned with the process, so examining what happened over a period of time. How did knowledge change? How did phenomena change over a period of time? It is interpretive. What is the meaning that people assigned to what you are looking at as part of your research? The researcher is the primary instrument. So the researcher is the 
one who will go out and collect the information and then having to look at the information to interpret what the data is telling him or her. It is an emerging research design. Why am I saying that? Previously, most studies was of a quantitative nature and many quantitative researchers don't actually, uh, qualitative research doesn't sit very well with them. They do not believe that qualitative research actually collects um, data. Um, and because the sample is also much smaller, um, the findings cannot essentially be generalized to the entire population. And so it is still in the process of finding value among more people. Um, and that is why what I mean when I say that it's an emerging research design, it does not detract from um, the fact that it is a credible research design. I did my doctorate by only using a qualitative research design. And so um, essentially, um, you know, uh, um, it's just for you to be aware um, that that um, you may need to 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 in, or you will encounter um, certain researchers in your path, um, who you who you will have to have certain courageous conversations with. But um, you are being equipped with how to deal with that. Hopefully, through through the um, following slides, it involves field work. It is contextual in nature. And it is an inductive process. So you're essentially looking for patterns and res resemblances. You're looking for what looks the same. Um, and you, you're trying to group information together that belongs together, depending on what it is that you are looking at. Or you also may want to create new knowledge by generating theory. OK, you can change. So the unit of analysis with quantitative data is words. On the quantitative side, you would largely count the number of times that something occurs or how many people said or whatever, you know, something or whatever. Um, here, you would look at the words and you would look at the um, meaning of what people said beyond how many times people said something or how many people said the same thing. Although those kinds of um, interpretations and analysis also has meaning within qualitative research. You usually look at large amounts of data. So the data is the actual words that the people speak. Um, it is your notes that you made as you were doing observations in the field, uh, the transcripts or focus groups or interviews. Um, and so it's large number of, of, of words that needs to be worked through. Findings are a lot more detailed because you are able to um, flesh out a phenomena by asking follow-up questions, by um, in, uh, interpreting um, the data or the words through thick, rich descriptions as Miriam explains it. Um, you look at the lived experiences of what people share with you and you don't necessarily have a predetermined point of view that you are enforcing. If you are doing that, you're bringing bias into your study, which you should not do. You look at direct quotations, observations and excerpts from documents or from, if it's an interview, what people had actually said. Um, and that becomes the raw data that you use. So how do you now, which methods do you employ? to collect the data in a qualitative research. One approach could be in-depth interviews where you conduct one-on-one um, uh, -on -one, or you can have two or three people in an interview and you now ask them uh, pertinent questions to, to understand certain experiences and perceptions. You could also have a focus group where you have group, uh, a group of people um, sitting around a table that can uh, speak to shared experiences, shared norms, shared knowledge. 
Um, you could do that through observations, either in the natural setting where you go into an organization and observe how work is being done, by whom, how long does it take, which what follows, which process and so on, or also during um, an interview where you then start making notes about certain things that you observe. Somebody's very nervous, they keep looking at their boss um, and so forth. And, and, and these are little observations that, that can also be interpreted. These document review um, where you would um, use documents of organizations or what is available on the internet. Um, and you can now also analyze the words in the document to, to come up with a, with a set of characteristics that pertains to that particular organization. You can change the slide. So in a focus group, I've just included a picture there. You have a group of people that talk to a specific um, phenomena. Um, and usually you should try and do this in a monthly environment where um, people are free to share I think somebody needs to mute. Okay, thank you. Um, so in a focus group, the researcher would explore researchers. Oh, this could be on the line. I hope it's not uh, disturbing everybody else. Um, the research explores responses from each member and the interaction also between the members that is a part of the group. And the researcher would then be the moderator or the facilitator that would um, elicit these different viewpoints, flesh it out in order to get more understanding of what is being discussed. Um, next slide. In an interview, you could either have a very structured interview where you have fixed questions that is uh, sent through to the participants before the time and you cannot deviate from that. You could have unstructured, which is more like a conversation that you have with somebody where there's no set um, questions and, and you're just chatting. Um, but in the process, you're also collecting data. And then the semi-structured um, interview is, is the one that is most used, which is a combination between structured and unstructured um, interview questions. Um, you would set up an appointment and have your questions sent through to the people that you'll be interviewing before the time to give them an opportunity to prepare so that they're not caught unawares. Um, but at the same time, you're also having a discussion, a, a, a normal conversation with them where you now can ask them to further explain certain information that they are sharing with you so that you can grasp it better. And this is where um, words now become the unit of analysis. So um, you can ask standardized questions and it is um, advisable that you do so, so that you can actually compare one interview to the next and then derive meaningful data that um, is, is based on the same questions. Um, it is good to record the interview, whether it's video recorded or just voice recorded, that is entirely the research. But it would also help you to have evidence of what you um, have collected later on. It's good to have it in a quiet room away from people. And then obviously there are a lot of ethical considerations that you need to apply, such as holding up the confidentiality of the people you're talking to, not disclosing the um, taking um, any uh, identifiable information out of the data that you will make available in your thesis or dissertation or in a, a research publication or so on. And uh, there's a few more I would advise you to, to read through ethical policies of your institution um, so that you also then make sure that you adhere to those. So the, the more effort that you put into devising your questions, the better the quality of the data that you will get from them. Next slide. And so with that in mind, I want to look at um, techniques being used to collect the data. So there's open-ended questions where the participant really can give you any response that they, that they want. You have closed questions where essentially respondents would answer yes or no. 
um, the semantic differentials where the participant would make a, a line on a mark to express level of agreement in a particular view. Or you have Likert scales, which is predominantly used in quantitative um, uh, questionnaires. Um, however, a quantitative questionnaire can also have qualitative questions within them where open-ended questions are being phrased for somebody to respond to in whichever way they would prefer. Okay, you can uh, continue. So with quantitative research questions, it's important that you phrase them correctly. Um, essentially, you want to be asking how or what questions. Um, it is advisable to keep the number of questions between five and 10. Um, for my own students, I usually tell them not to have more than five questions. You want to make sure that you ask pertinent questions that pertain to the objective that you want to, to achieve. And um, you don't want the interview to be too broad. You want to make sure that you get proper information for your objectives that you are trying to, to achieve. Um, and so you always can ask fleshing out questions that can give you that thick rich descriptions that we spoke about earlier. But essentially your aim would be to explore, to describe, to understand, to discover um, and so on. Um, and you're essentially trying to understand what had happened, particularly over a period of time, and what was the meaning that the, that the people you are talking to derived from what happened over this period. Next slide. So the clarity of the question is important. You also want to make sure that you use appropriate language. When you are, are sending the questions to people that you will be interviewing, make sure that it's spelled correctly, the wording, and that the grammar used is also correct. So it's good to have um, the questions edited before the time. Make the questions as short as possible. Have one idea in a question. You don't want to ask them um, about one and two and three. You want to ask them about one and the next question is going to ask about two, but you need to phrase it in a way that you will um, retrieve as much information as possible for each of these um, ideas that you're trying to explore. Use positive terms. Don't use double negatives. An example would be, you are not against the death penalty. So against is negative and the death penalty is negative. So, so you don't wanna have these double negatives in one sentence, okay. Um, also, um, avoid overlapping alternative choices. So you can either do this or you can do that. No, just ask one question. Avoid influencing people's responses. That brings in the bias we spoke about. Make sure that the questions are as neutral as possible. Um, if it is a questionnaire that you're administering, there's a section other that can be used for alternatives where people can add additional information that you may have not asked about. Don't ask personal questions. Be realistic about what people can remember and be realistic about what they are able or willing to share. Also, when you are asking things, define your term. Make sure that what you have in mind is what you are actually asking so that the other person also sing from the same hymn sheet, right? So if you're asking how many chocolates can you eat at a time, the reality is you can have a small bar of chocolates or you can have a chocolate sweet or you can have a large chocolate. So which one is it that you're talking about? So make sure that you define your terms. And then if you do pilot studies, it can also help you to refine your questions and to ask them in a way that they are clear to the person that you are speaking to. Please stay away from leading questions because this also brings bias into research. And I've given two examples here. Do you agree that wrestling is a barbaric sport? and sane people would not participate in such activities. So what have you just done? This person could, have, could be a wrestling fanatic, but he's not gonna tell you now that he's now so interested in wrestling because the way you portrayed it is, is, is so negative. And he doesn't now want you to think that he falls into this um, a barbaric way of, of thinking or behaving. 
The second question, do you have any problems with your boss? This is something that is very personal, um, you know, so, so make sure when you phrase it that you don't lead people into what you want them to answer. Okay, you can change the slide. You want to be asking probing questions. You want to, to try and get as much detail on a particular issue. So you could say, tell me more about that. Or you could ask them, how did you feel about that? Or what did you mean when you said X, Y, Z? Okay. So examples of interview questions would be, which factors led to your department's decision to use open um, educational resources, OERs, in, in your study material? Or how have your interactions with stakeholders impacted your implementation of online examinations? So you're asking direct questions and you can then ask um, probing questions to, to analyze that further. You can change the slide. Okay, and so that brings us to the end of, of the presentation. Um, I, I hope that I was able to, to give you a, a very high level overview, but in a language that you could understand and relate to. And certainly if there are any questions, I'm, I'm 